Good morning. I'm so glad to see everyone this morning. We do not have a bulletin today, so let me just mention something that was going to be in this bulletin for today, but you'll have it for next week. But if you're like me, I like to go ahead and get things on my calendar as soon as I possibly can. So, uh, March 8th and 9th, we are going to have our marriage conference. We have had feedback for the past few years we've done it in July, and we've had feedback from some of the couples in our church that it always happens that when we have our marriage conference, they are going away on family vacation, and they'd like to be there to participate in it. So we're going to do it earlier this year, so maybe we'll get um, different people who can be there. Hopefully the same people who come in July will still be able to come in March. But go ahead, put that on your calendars, March 8th and 9th, and this really is a marriage conference for all ages. That is something that I always enjoy with our marriage conferences is that we have newly married couples of all ages. Um, we have people who are engaged. We have people who have been married for many, many years. There's a great mix. And like Pastor said at our first service, it's so true that if you have a well-seasoned marriage that you've been married for quite some time, we, we need you at our marriage conference. Your marriage will get a blessing from the marriage conference, but you will be such an encouragement and a blessing to couples who are maybe going through something that you've been through so that you could help them and share with them. So put that on your calendar. March 8th, March 9th, hope that you're going to be able to be with us and we'll have more information to come soon. But we're going to go ahead and jump into our worship portion of this service. I hope you have come ready to sing praises to God. I'm so glad to see you here. Will you stand and sing with us? If you've been walking the same old road for miles and miles been hearing the same old voice tell the same old lies if you're trying to fill the same old holes inside there's a better life there's a better life if you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way maker Father, but we don't. 
and it will get such a healthy dose of peace if we will let go of things that we are holding on to, Father, that you never, never want us to carry that weight by ourselves. So I pray, God, that whatever is going on in every person's life here today, Father, that we'll just turn all of it over to you, God. I pray that even in this moment right now, that if people have come into this place and they are weighed down, they're burdened, they feel chained, Father, I pray that even in this moment that they're going to feel a little bit lighter. We need that peace, God, that only can come from you. God, I thank you so much for letting us come into this place and sing praises to you and worship you and have a wonderful time of fellowship. God, we thank you for those who are listening on the radio. We thank you, God, those who are watching on TV, on YouTube. God, um, we pray that the message that is heard in this place today, it reaches um, far past our walls. So, God, please just uh, bless everything that we're trying to do. God, we want to do our best for you. I pray that you are pleased with our worship. I pray that we've come to be an encouragement to each other. We've come to worship you. We've come to learn. There are so many things, God, that we can leave from this place with. So I pray that we all come open. Please bless this offering. Please multiply it. Please bless our pastor as he leads us in his sermon. Please bless Sherry as she leads Children's Church. God, we love you so very much. Hear and pray. Amen. You may be seated.
Children's Church. If you have a child between the ages of three and second grade and would like for them to attend, just have them meet at the middle back door. And remember at the end of the service to go down the stairs to sign them out. is risen 
Sometimes it's funny how God does things in, in youth. We've been talking about um, what deep faith means. Deep faith doesn't mean that you say something that's profound. It's when you put yourself in a situation that only God can do something through. That's the equivalent of deep. And we just saying that your perfect loves, your perfect love drowns our fears. And the truth is we, we can't experience that as long as we stay in the shallow end. You've got to get deep. You've got to get in over your head. You've got to be in a situation where only God can do something in your life to experience that fully. Man, God doesn't get mad when you get afraid. He gets excited when you get afraid and you still move forward. You don't let fear stop you. That is when your faith is exercised at its greatest. So let's pray this morning and pray that I'm going to let you pray for just a moment by yourself. And I want you to specifically say, God, I'm terrified of this. But then I'm going to ask you to commit that even though I'm terrified of this, I'm going to move forward. I'm going to continue. I'm going to press on. And I'm going to put myself right in the middle of what scares me the most. Because I know that's when I'm going to see your perfect love drown my fears. Take a moment and pray. Father, this morning, I pray that we've come to you and we've told you, God, this scares us. This scares the mess out of us. But God, I also pray that this morning we've committed, we've made a vow, a promise that we're going to move forward still. God, we're going to put ourselves right in the middle of what scares us the most. We're going to get in over our head where only you can do something. God, I pray that as those prayers lifted from this sanctuary this morning, that you heard them and God, you got the biggest smile on your face because your children were putting themselves in a vulnerable situation where they had to have you intervene in their life. And God, nothing brings more glory to you than when your children realize their need for you and depend on you. And so that's this morning where we all are, God. We're realizing our need for you. We're depending on you. Now, God, show up and do something great. Father, we're so grateful this morning that we can come, that we can have moments like this where we can just talk to our Father, we can talk to you, God, and we know that it's only because of the price that you paid that we have this opportunity. God, this morning as we continue to worship, as we look at your word, just continue to move in our hearts. God, clear our minds of everything else that's going on and help us just to focus solely on you and what you have to say to us this morning. And Father, as we leave here today, help us to face our fears with faith, knowing that you are going to be the one that does something. And God, we're going to see an awesome victory on the other side of it. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for this time now. Bless it as only you can. It's in your name we pray.
Am I working? There you go. I knew y'all would figure it out in a minute. How are y'all this morning? Well, I want to thank you. Uh, this week has been a wonderful week. We got uh, the first week of our 21 days of prayer, and we've been having around 30 people, maybe the most that we've ever had at one of our 21-day events. The thing that thrills me the most of those 30 or so people that are coming is they're younger than we've ever had before. And I appreciate so much those of you that are putting forth some effort to get here at 6 o'clock. I know that's a hard time to get here. Some people come in and begin the, the hour with us, and then they have to slip out and go to work. Uh, but I appreciate so much those of you that are a part of our 21-day effort. Uh, this week uh, is... Uh, the emphasis is on intercession. Uh, if you can't be here this week, at least let us pray for you. Uh, whatever your needs are, let us pray for you. If you don't want to give details about what we need to pray for you about, if you'll just write your name on a card, there will be somebody, get that card, and during those times that we are worshiping together, uh, there will be somebody that is praying for you. Uh, but I appreciate so much those of you that are really putting forth a, a good bit of effort to be here early and coming and joining us. Uh, it's exciting to see. I have uh, a nine-month-old granddaughter, and it's exciting to watch her grow. Uh, I was a little disappointed in the early months of her life. She didn't do anything. Uh, they told me about some dirty diapers, but I never got to see any of those. Didn't want to see any of those. Uh, but she's beginning to develop her personality, beginning to develop who she is. And there are times when she'll look at me. Uh, I don't know if she's given you a kiss yet or not, but there's been two different times she has reached over and just washed my face with one of them big slobbery kisses. And she's got to where every once in a while she will reach out her arms to me. And I cannot tell you as a grandfather what that does to my heart. It really, really just thrills my heart. Now, Terry can watch all this stuff on a phone and get all excited about it. But I like the live stuff. Watching her grow is a great joy in my life. Watching you grow as you worship God is a great joy in my life. I still remember the first time uh, when we were over in the other building... Uh, now, all, we're Baptists, and we're still Baptists. I'm not trying to say we're changing from being a Baptist. But I still remember the first time somebody raised their hand in a worship service. We had one of our ladies in the choir. It was in the choir. The person raised their hand. They just got real excited, and the next thing you know, the hand went up. They were worshiping and praising God. And a person in the choir leaned forward and looked down. They'd never seen anything like that before, not in a Baptist church. But you all are becoming a little more free, and it's exciting to watch. And uh, I want to tell you, uh, we, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of music being published today and a lot of great music that is being written. Uh, I'd rather hear our band and our singers than anybody I know. When I was coming up the steps to, uh, out of Sunday school, I had run just a little bit late, and they had already started. And uh, the, the band and the music that I was hearing sounded just like a professional group. I want to tell you, they really lift my heart. And you lift my heart in worship when you really uh, uh, just step out and, and worship, when you're free in your worship. Okay, did uh, Holly Joe mention the marriage conference? Uh, we, we really want to encourage you to come be a part of the marriage conference. If you've been married for quite some time, you may be thinking, uh, I don't need to learn more about marriage. Our marriage is good. We've worked through some difficulties. We've learned how to fight and survive, and we're just, we're, we're making it. Well, let me tell you, if you have been through that, if you've got a few little battle scars, or if you come through those times without any bruises, uh, our folks just sort of need to see that. 
They need to be around some people that have gone through some tough times or managed smooth sailing, whatever you've got. Sometimes it's just good to have professionals around that you can sort of look at and model, ask some questions. So let me encourage any of you that are free that weekend to come and be a part of that. Uh, You might learn something or someone might learn something from you. We would really want to invite you to come. Well, this morning I want to talk with you about sharing the gospel, and uh, we're starting in 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 7. I'm sorry, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 5. Israel wanted a king, and when they asked for a king, Samuel really has a fit. Now, Samuel was a holy man, so as I thought about this, I wondered Did Samuel have a holy fit? Now the first group laughed. Come on. Y'all are laughing at me because that wasn't funny. (laughs) Okay. But anyway, the Bible says, look, they told him. They're talking to Samuel. You're getting old, Samuel. And your sons, they're just not like you. Give us a king so that we can be like all the other nations. Now, it frustrated Samuel because they assumed, he assumed that they were rejecting him. But God came to Samuel and says, okay, Samuel, calm down, calm down. Verse number seven, do as they say, the Lord replied, for it is me they are rejecting, not you. Don't, they don't want me to be their king any longer. God says, Samuel, look, you got to calm down. It's not you they're rejecting. They are rejecting me. They just don't want me to be their king anymore. Israel's request was not a rejection of Samuel. It was really a rejection of God. It hurt Samuel that they had even asked for a king. It hurt God in that they had asked for a king so they could be like other nations. But God granted their request. Now, I want this group especially to listen to what I'm about to say. Please hear these words. Peer pressure is powerful. It really is powerful. You see it in people's lives all the time. Peer pressure is a powerful force that we have to deal with. One of the things you need to understand, peer pressure is not only powerful, peer pressure is expensive. If you're going to try to keep up with the Joneses, you got a lot of stuff you got to buy, a lot of stuff you got to change. Every time they change, you're going to have to change. Peer pressure can get very expensive as well. Now, God allowed them to have a king. And he allowed them to have kings like the other nations did. Israel was a united nation in the beginning. But it had three kings that served them 40 years each. Saul served for 40 years. Then David served for 40 years. And then King Solomon served for 40 years. Now to have a king like other nations meant that there would be times that you'd have good kings... And you'd have bad kings. Look at 1 Kings 11, verse number 6. So Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord. There would be kings like evil, uh, like Solomon, who did evil in the eyes of the Lord. But Solomon was not always an evil king. The Bible tells us that Solomon had such a close relationship with God one time that God called Solomon off to himself. And he said to him, look, I'm going to give you anything you ask for. You just, you just make a request. I'm going to grant your request. Name whatever it is. I want to bless you. And Solomon, being a young, tender ruler, he didn't know what to ask for. He didn't know how to go about governing these people. And yet he was king. So he asked God for wisdom. And God said, oh, wow, that's, that's interesting. You'd ask for wisdom. Most people would have asked for power or money or something like that. God said, because you've asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you power. 
I'm going to give you money. And he really was one of the wealthiest kings that has ever lived. As a matter of fact, he was one of the wisest kings that had ever lived. When we get to the story of Jesus, much later in the history of God's people, Jesus is still talking about the wisdom of Solomon. But we see on the page that Solomon did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. When you began looking down the list, all kind of kings did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And Solomon had started so wonderfully, and yet he ended up so badly. After a while, it even gets worse. See if you can find there on your listening guide, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 25. 1 Kings 16, verse 25. Omri, everybody say Omri. Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and he sinned more than all of those that had ever come before him. It was like, let's see how bad I can be. I know this guy was bad, but I'm going to be worse. Now, look at his son, verse number 30. Uh, Ahab, the son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those that went before him. It's as though when you ask for a king so you can be like other nations, you have to deal with the fact that there's going to be some Bad kings in the mix. But they were not all bad. Look at 1 Kings 15. The Bible tells us about David. David, uh, for David had done what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he had not failed to keep any of the Lord's commands all the days of his life. When you read through the New Testament there in Acts chapter 13, You see that David is actually called a man after God's own heart. David was the guy who did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He did not fail to do any of the stuff that the Lord had commanded him to do. And not only did he do good, but he did good all the days of his life. Look if you would at Josiah, I mean, uh, yeah, Josiah, 2 Kings 12. Josiah did what was right In the eyes of the Lord. And then you'll find a king like Amaziah. Amaziah, (laughs) he was good. He made the team, but he was not a starter on anybody's team. Look what Amaziah, the Bible says about Amaziah, 2 Kings 14. Amaziah, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but not like his father David had done. Folks, what the Bible is doing is showing us that some people are good and some people are bad. And I'm going to guess that's true of us. Some of you are good. Some of you are bad. I bet it's true of you as an individual. Don't you have some good days? Don't you have some bad days? Well, just a little bit. Now, who's going to measure that little bit? Sometimes I can say I'm a a little ill, and my wife will say something like, a little? That's funny, too. I'm going to start laughing for you. Uh, And sometimes I don't even notice that I'm ill, and they will notice that I'm ill. Sometimes I think they make it up, though. Now, on on the listening guide that you have, what the Bible tells us is that All have sinned. Every single one of us. Last Sunday morning, I told you that everyone you know has sinned. And the Bible says not only that we've sinned, but that we come short of the glory of God. Everyone you know has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Not only have everyone that you know, but everyone that you see has sinned and come short of the glory of God. Whether you know them or not, everyone you see has sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God has sent you into the time and space that you live so that you can share with others that Jesus came into this world to save people from their sin. 
you have there on your listening guide a morality ladder. Can we get that picture up on the screen? It's the last in the slides of today's message. Y'all hate silence in church? It's, it's, it's kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? It's like stepping in an elevator. Is anybody going to talk? And then you have one clown that specs, steps up and says something, and you think, well, that goofy thing, why is he talking in an elevator? What you have here is called a morality ladder. Now, I've already put two names on the list. One of them is David. Because of who David is, a man after God's own heart, not only is he a man after God's own heart, when you get to heaven, you're going to hear the name David several times. In the book of Revelation, you see his name mentioned. Not anything about him specifically, but that name fills the air. And because of who David was... I give him a high mark on that morality ladder. But if you go back and look at that verse that I've got there from the Old Testament, David was a man who did that which God had commanded him to do, and he did that all the days of his life. And then you have that little sentence on the end of that passage, and you just kind of wonder, why did he throw it in there? David did everything the Lord commanded except with that issue with Uzziah the Hittite. It's there to show that even the best of the best sin and come short of the glory of God. Now, I put David high on the ladder of morality. I put his son underneath him. I don't put him at the bottom. Even though the Bible says Solomon did evil in the eyes of the Lord, he still made a great contribution to the people of God. We have much of his wisdom packed into our Bible. What I'm doing here is I'm saying that I think David's morality is a little better than Solomon's morality. And if we tried to put the other people on there, I don't know where you would put them, but I would put them all underneath David and Solomon. Now, this won't work as you witness to other people. There's a lot of people out there that don't know David or Solomon. And of those who know about David and Solomon... They really just don't care. So when you begin to share with other people about the morality ladder, what you need to do is start with them. Ask them, who is one of the best people that you know? And then you write their name wherever they say to put it on that morality ladder. Now, don't lose yourself at this point. Because when you ask somebody who is the best person that they know, they may put out a name and your first response is going to be, you'd put them on this morality ladder? And all of a sudden you've lost what this morality ladder is all about. What you want to do is ask people, where, who would you put on this morality ladder? And, and then you just list whoever they put. It might be the president, it might be the governor, it might be the police chief, it might be somebody you have no respect for whatsoever. But whatever name they give you, write it down or let them write it down wherever it goes. And as they think about where to put various people on this morality ladder, you ask the question, where would you put yourself? And wherever they put that, you write that down. Just put it right there. Now, one thing I want you to notice about the morality ladder is it doesn't quite reach all the way up to where God is. And this puts us right back where we were last week. There is a separation between man and God. On the morality ladder, when you present this to your friends, you actually draw it this way. There is a separation between God and man. When I think about that separation this way, instead of like we talked about last week, this way, I can't help but to think about Job. Job says, oh, that there was a mediator between God and man, that they could reach up and touch God and reach down and touch me. Folks, I want to tell you, that's what Jesus Christ did for every single one of us. You've got friends. 
You've got family. You've got people in your life. You've got people you know. You've got people you will see that need to know that God has sent someone who can reach up and touch God and reach down and touch every single one of us. Folks, I don't know if that excites you, but that's good news. That's what the Bible calls the gospel. Do you get excited about the gospel? Yeah, you know, I thought uh, ever since I, had, I sat across from uh, Chris, uh, what was his name, Chris Milligan, Chris Milligan, and his son. Do you remember that shot that he made? I bet everybody in the stand sat just like y'all sit. Was anybody there? Anybody go to that game? What was it like inside the game? It was what? Exciting. Exciting. Let me tell you, when you think about what Jesus has done for you, you need to get very excited. The Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and says there's only one. There is one mediator between God and man. Now contain yourself. There was a time when God reached up to heaven through Jesus Christ, Jesus reaching up and touching God, and one day he reached down and touched you. One day he reached down and touched you. That's exciting. Okay. Y'all not going to get excited for me, are you? God actually reached from heaven through Jesus Christ, and he touched your life. He saved you from your sin. Now, what he did for you, he wants to do for every single person that you see. Some of them you will know. Some of them you won't know. And it may be that you'll enter into a conversation with them and they'll become a friend. But you need to share with them about the love of Christ. Over the last couple of weeks, I have told you over and over again, the Lord is with you. You are a mighty warrior. We're trying to put some tools in your hand in which you can go into battle. Last week, we talked about the great guff and, those, and that picture and we saw how there was no way man could get from where he is to God. And he tries so many different things. He tries uh, good works. He tries religion. He tries philosophy. He tries mor mor morality. But none of those things will get him across that great gulf that separates God from man. This week we're talking about the very same thing, but we turn it this way. And in this way, there is a biblical picture that shows us that Jesus Christ did that very thing. The gap between the morality ladder and God is where Jesus Christ came into this world, died for your sin, then rose from the grave, and now he stands ready to reach up with and touch his hand to God and reach down wherever you are, whatever you've done, and reach down and touch your heart. Everyone you know is a sinner. Everyone you see is a sinner. Jesus Christ came into this world to save people from their sins. And he just simply wants to use you to get the good news out to the people that you know. Now, this morality ladder can be used by you to help your friends, the people you know, to see that there is a gulf between them and God. And Jesus Christ is reaching out to touch God and reaching down to touch them. You can use this to help people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you can also use this to help people see where they are in their relationship with Christ. I believe the biggest church in the world is the church down home. A lot of times when I'm out talking to people, I'll say, you go to church? And immediately they'll say, oh yeah, I got a church down home. I don't know how many people are actually members of the church down home, but it's a huge church, let me tell you. So as you're talking to people and someone indicates to you that they are already a Christian, you can ask them the question, well, if we talk about this ladder of morality, 
Where would you put yourself? Would you put yourself at the top? Would you put yourself at the bottom? As a matter of fact, let's do that right now. I want you to think about the best time you've ever had in your spiritual journey. The time when you and God were so close you just couldn't believe how much you loved God and how much He loved you and how many blessings He's given you. You're just passionate about the things of God. That would be the top rung of the ladder for many of you. If you put yourself on that morality ladder today, would it be at the top? Would it be somewhere toward the middle? Or have you sort of slid down that ladder and you're not quite to the bottom, but you're a long way from where you used to be? How about your life? As you think about where you are today, spiritually, thinking seriously about the things of God, are you as passionate today as you once were? Or has some of that passion sort of worn off a little bit? Some of the new sort of gone. The love you had for God is not the love and the passion that you had at one time. And for some of you, you even miss where you used to be, don't you? And you really do miss how it used to be between you and God. Where would you put yourself on that morality ladder. Now, I want us to pray. I really want to just take a few minutes and let you do some writing on your listening guide there. First thing I'm going to pray for is that God will open your eyes and open your heart and, and that he'll help you to see people that you can actually engage in a conversation about where they are in their relationship with Christ. So you have friends, family, they've never entered into a relationship with Christ. Maybe they want to, they just don't know how, but they've never done it. And God has put you in their life so that they can understand that Jesus has come into this world to save people from their sin. They never knew that. And they're so glad that you had an opportunity. And that's why God has put you where he is. That's why you have the relationships that you have. That's why your paths cross with those people that you don't know. It's an opportunity for you just to pray and let God speak to your heart. You already know, some of you already know who those people are. He's been prompting you. He's been challenging you. Last Sunday morning when I preached the message about the little pamphlet that we had, the little track, there was one guy came out and he said, I'm going to give this to and he started telling me about this guy that he worked with. And he said, you know, I've, been, I've had him on my mind for months, he said. He said, thank you for giving me this because I'm just going to give it to him and tell him I've been praying for him. Now, I hope you'll do more than that. But if that's all you do, that's a wonderful thing. But I want you to pray that God will press on your heart Names of people you work with, you go to school with, ever what your relationship with them is. God may impress upon you this morning some name that may be changed forever because God is speaking to you right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your spirit in times like this. When you speak to our hearts, when you guide us in the direction you'd have us to go. And Father, I pray for moments like this, that every heart would open up and we would be very sensitive to what your Spirit would lead us to do. Help us in these moments just to draw close to you and listen as you speak to our hearts.